All right, guys, I think. I think we're live. Let me uh let me just make sure everything's flowing right. There we go. There I am. All right. So we're looking at this sword again. Um and I was having a little bit of trouble with it yesterday. And I definitely think uh, it was an issue, or it's an, so it had something to do with the scale of the item in the first place. Uh, so that's just something to keep in mind whenever you're making your props or your objects. Uh, depending on the scale of the object, it can affect the Dynamesh resolution you need to use. Um, I don't know exactly the, the fix for it. Like sometimes you can hit unify. Like, uh, I have a custom interface, but you can find it here in deformation and unifying that resizes it to, to ZBrush's like standard unit size. But then you'll have scaling issues when you import it back into uh, whatever program you're using like Blender, Maya, um, and also like, uh, the anti-aliasing in, in ZBrush is a little, little wonky sometimes. That's why it doesn't look like it's, that's why the edge looks jagged, but it's actually pretty good. Like when you hit a BPR render, it kind of adds the anti-aliasing. Um, but yeah, I got the parts dynameshed. And I just did a couple of, uh, I'll just zoom in here. I just scribbled some runes here because I'm not sure exactly what the, I think it was Ryan. Let me double check. Ryan, he had a question. Rydell, sorry, had a question about it. The blender to ZBrush process. Um, but basically, all I did was uh. Uh, let me pop Blender open here. Just to recap what we did for Rydell with this sword. The sword originally, oh, what's going on here? Was in separate parts. Not the one I want. I want this one. Each of the uh, these separate parts, like this is the inside of the blade. Let me get a different mat cap so it's a little easier to see. Maybe that one? A little better, I guess. Hard to tell what's uh what's gonna show up well in in OBS or on the stream. That one looks a little easier, but uh, basically, basically it was just these parts. You know, it was like a couple of planes and it can be hard to sculpt on planes. Uh, so if you make it a, basically a watertight object, um, when you dynamesh it or divide it, it typically will have an easier time uh, whoops, working with it. So I just went through each of your objects and made sure they were um, 
watertight. Like for example, this one didn't have any faces here or here or here. And uh, there were also some uh, some random random things I found that were a little odd. The the blade wasn't symmetrical. It looked symmetrical, but it wasn't for some reason. So all I did was I deleted half of it, and then I added the uh, mirror modifier. Um, and then I just went back into object mode and applied it. But I, I just kind of cleaned up the model. There were a few parts where there were some, for some reason there were extra vertices. Uh, but yeah, I made sure each part was clean and ready for for sculpting by making sure it was airtight or watertight. And then I just uh, brought it over into ZBrush. And I'm not sure if it was the format that I originally got it from, but uh, something with the sword was huge to be uh, when I imported it. Um, it was probably like. I don't know the each the I have blender set to meters and one grid unit is uh one meter and it was like I think it was like 15 grid units tall or something like that so it it was big um but to work around that I just had to uh dynamesh it at a really high resolution so Depending on your machine, it can take a little while while you're dynameshing it, but uh, that was how I got around the scaling issue, basically. And then I just kind of, for quick demo purposes, I just sculpted these little runes on there so we could see kind of how it's looking. I got a little one up here too, it's kind of hidden. And we'll do a, give you a quick BPR render of that. Uh, let's try this mat cap. Zoom in a little here. And if you wanted to apply, use ZBrush to apply your uh, colors for a color ID map, it's it's really pretty simple. Um. Basically, let's uh, we'll start off with the blade here. Let's go in the. We'll just isolate this part, and I'll get this matte cap so it's easier to see the color. It's like a flat white matte, and we'll just jump over to a different brush. And basically, you just want to select, deselect, Z add or Z sub. And you just want it to be on RGB. That'll add colorize to your models. And uh, you can just go through. And there's a little paintbrush icon here. And uh, if you just hit like shift and tap it, it'll enable colorize on all your subtools. But uh, from there, all you do is you kind of pick the color you want. Let's say you want to color this part of the sword, this uh, dark green. And you just hit fill object and that part will be dark green. And because we isolated that part, the other sections, we can choose to make those a different color. So we'll make that a, kind of make that a dark fuchsia or whatever that is and then this last part make that a dark blue and you basically go through and do that for uh, each part you know we can uh, hop over to the handle here or to the, the, the guard and make that maybe a, a dark yellow see jump over to the guard here got three different parts for this we'll probably <clears throat> let's see 
hide that part and that part because these are both part of the grip you probably want those to be the same color we'll make those a nice teal and then we'll hide that part or let me hide these parts again and i'm just gonna make these one uh, poly group and then we can hide that one hide that one and make these one poly group and then we'll make them the peachy color and then all we have left is the pommel and we have two two parts to that and then you just uh isolate each part and just same process uh oh what happened there oh yeah that's right i Let's make sure that's one. We'll make this one. We'll make this that color. And then we'll isolate this part. And we'll make that pink. Actually, that might not be a good color for that one. Make it a light green. There we go. Whoops, that's the same color, isn't it? Don't want to do that. I need to make that a nice dark red. There we go. Yeah, and then once you have your poly paint applied to each piece, you just have to make sure this little paintbrush icon is enabled. And you can see that here in polypaint, the colorize option will be, uh, the button will be pressed or lit up. And when you have that enabled, you'll find that when you export it, it'll export the vertex colors so you can use them in Substance Painter or even Blender or even uh, Marmoset Tool Bag to make a color ID map as long as you pick the vertex color option as the source for your ID map. Oh man, not gonna lie, I had a tough time waking up today. Whew. Okay, so now, okay, let me grab my mouse because we're gonna be doing a lot of menu stuff. Once you have that all done, let me, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and turn colorize off. Whoops. Let me hop in up to one. Back up there. Now that that's done, the, the next major step is to decimate it, to get it ready to, to bake. Um, and basically you decimate it so that it's not so heavy of a mesh uh, because ZBrush handles extremely heavy meshes very well. But if you were to bring this into to Blender or even if you were using it as your high poly source in like Painter or Marmoset, it would, it would be very slow. So we'll hop in a Decimation Master and I'll just pop this over here for now and the we'll hop this up to 50% got my keyboard hidden under here I should pull it out a little more there we go and you want to, what you want to do is you want to hit use and keep poly paint. 
that way the paint uh, the colors we just added will be respected in the, the decimation and we'll still be able to make use of them for our color ID map and you can either hit uh, decimate current or pre-process current or pre-process all I'm just gonna do pre-process current um, because it can take a little while especially especially when you're streaming um, from what I understand Dyna, uh, not Dynamesh, Decimation Master uh, really hits your CPU and one more thing that I should have done that I'll do right after this is save um, that's definitely something that, uh, you want to do before you decimate because sometimes it'll freeze up and just crash basically if it's excuse me if it's a really high really dense model and um, and that's the worst Especially once you've got it like all ready to go we'd have to like for example if it crashed now I would have had to apply all the poly paint colors again and that is not fun okay so when we got the pre-process done and now we can decimate current and we'll just uh, isolate that and it's still way too dense the uh, 500,000 so just do another pre-process and decimate a little better I like to try to keep each piece um, under a hundred thousand uh, active points, with as long as it doesn't sacrifice the the details too much. Like that still looks really good, so we could we can definitely go lower. This mid current. Like that's still really high, but this is just for the high poly. Hey, how you doing? Thanks for uh, joining the stream. I'm just kind of going over uh, decimation and keeping your uh, your poly paint active. But for some reason. It's not active. That's weird. But I can just go back and hit this piece. And let's see, we should be able to auto group that. There we go. And isolate this piece. And we'll make this one dark green or light green. And then we'll make the other one pink. There we go. I'm not sure why it didn't respect that. You're supposed to. I thought I did. Um, where are you? Why is it all so hard to spot that decimation mess? Yeah, using keep poly paint. That's odd that it didn't do it. I have it enabled. Let's uh, let's try it on this piece. And we'll find out. 
It might get a little, uh, the stream might get a little boggy while I do this, so if it looks like I'm a robot, that's what it is. Boom. Decimation is like a weird thing, like sometimes it's so slow. But every now and then, like on something that I think it's going to take a long time on, it'll, it'll just breeze right through it. Okay, so we got a ways to go. A couple more still. I like to try to get them under 100,000. I find that they still hold their details, but are much more manageable when you bring them back into uh, Blender or Maya or in Substance Painter. Your bakes don't take as long. And we're at 66, so I'll be, I'll call that one good. And then we'll just continue the process on each part. I wonder why I didn't do that for that first part I had. For the poly paint. Let's see where, whoa, this, uh, this piece is super dense. All right, 300. The nice thing is, is each time you decimate the same piece, it, it goes a little faster each time because it has less uh, calculating to do, I guess. What are we at? 199, still too high. And you can definitely do all of your parts at once. Well, not at once, but you can pick pre-process all and decimate all. But I definitely don't want to try to do that during a stream because it that definitely takes a long time. Because it goes through each piece one by one. That's one of those things, if you did do that, you would kind of like depending on how complex your model was, you could, uh, you could hit pre-process all and then go have a snack. <laughs> but we'll get all these decimated and then we'll uh, go over a couple ways to export it. Come on, little computer. This is a really heavy, heavy mesh. Five million points. And again, that was because of the scaling. Um, I don't know how Rydell exported it or what his uh, settings were when he originally modeled it, but um, the sword was gigantic. Like it was like the size of a the height, anyway, of like an apartment complex. Oh no. No. Cancel. Okay, that was close. I almost hit decimate all, oh, but I. I canceled it in time. Two and a half million. Uh, 
Oh, okay, that's what it was. Yeah, I don't know if you uh, caught the first part of the stream. All I did was, um, I made each part of your mesh watertight. So instead of just planes, it was like actual, like an actual box. Yeah. Well, the, uh, let me hop in a blender and just kind of touch base on that real quick. The like for for the blade, you did uh, you, all you had. There were a couple oddities, but the main issue is like whenever. Like I find whenever you're going to sculpt something, whether it's in Blender or ZBrush, um, if you have, if it's just like a, like a thin mesh like this, like thin planes, like there's no face between these two edges, it, it, it has a hard time, uh, Dynameshing it for some reason. For some, it, I don't know exactly what that is, but if you have them have faces in there like that, whenever you divide it, or not divide it, but dynamesh it, it just it'll hold your your edges better. And in the case of this uh, model, I had to dynamesh it at a really high level to to hold those creases. Um, and from what I understand, Blender and ZBrush, ZBrush doesn't really respect Blender's creasing for some reason. Um, I think it only respects like Maya, like there's a special plugin for Maya creasing. Um, but unfortunately, I don't think it respects Blender's creasing. So like whenever you crease something in, in Blender and import it into ZBrush, it's not really gonna do anything for you. So you would either have to uh, do like a really high poly model with like your uh, subdivision style modeling and like... Um, mostly I just kind of taught myself uh, I did go to, uh, I did take a graphic design course about five years ago now. <laughs> kind of weird that it was that long ago, but um, there was a very short part of the course where we used 3D. We used 3DS Max. Um, we didn't do anything stylized. We, we were doing like, uh, like sports team logos, stuff like that. Nothing, nothing fancy, very little. It was just a small part of the course that we just kind of had to do, but I really enjoyed 3D modeling. And um, the last year or two, I've just kind of been drawing and painting because I just wanted something creative to do. And I remembered enjoying doing 3D art. And so I tried to get back into it using 3DS Max. But as soon as I found out that it wasn't truly free, um, because, you know, like I, I kind of wanted to explore maybe 3D printing stuff and maybe, uh, you know, like, I don't know, selling little 3D prints and trinkets and stuff, but you can't use anything you make in 3DS Max or Maya. Uh, anything you use with a student's license is technically theirs. And I didn't like that. So I started using Blender because a buddy of mine who's uh, pretty experienced in the, he, he does mostly film and special effects stuff, but he told me to give Blender a try. And uh, I pretty much haven't looked back. I've just, I just really enjoy 3D modeling, particularly sculpting, 3D sculpting, I should say, even though I'm not that good at it. Um, hey, how you doing? I guess I should bring this over here so everybody can see the chat. Here we go. What does that do? There we go. Yeah, the that's basically how I started learning, and I 
would just watch tutorials. Um, for a while there, I had a subscription to uh, like 3D World magazine and just read articles and watch a lot of YouTube videos like this, basically. Um, I do play a lot of video games, not a lot, but I play like a uh, World of Warcraft, um, Starcraft, a lot of Blizzard games, Dota, League of Legends. And it's funny because like I'll just go around the video games and take screenshots of things I like and kind of try to mimic the style basically. And that's kind of how I learned how to, to, to do stylized assets but uh where were we so yeah when you <coughs> excuse me are preparing your models for zbrush you don't necessarily need to sub d model them but uh just make sure they're watertight and not just super thin meshes or super thin planes that way when you um go to dynamesh it you might have to go to a pretty high resolution but it'll still respect your your edges let's see we're in the middle of dynameshing this one we'll do another pre-processing on it and i applied a poly paint to each major section I wasn't entirely sure um, why each part of the sword, like I guess you want to like make each part look a little different. Oh yeah, I mean hopefully I'm doing, I don't know if I'm, uh... let me get my, Hopefully I'm doing it in a way that makes sense because I'm definitely not a pro. But like for example on the blade here, let me turn Sculptress off. Why? Why is it not? Oh, oh well. Like, I'm not sure why you kept each of these as se separate um, parts. I don't know, man. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe in about a, another year or two. But um, I think you could get away with modeling the blade as one part, even though you want to, unless you want to add like specific effects to each piece but I mean this is still fine we just got to decimate some more so just keep going with that okay I gotcha sometimes it is better to model uh, I found anyway to model things um, in separate parts uh, especially if you want to make it low poly because if you keep each part separate, you don't have to put as many, like, like if this was one part, you would have to add a bunch of support loops here just to get support this area here. But because they're separate, the, uh, this is the only part that has to have all those extra support loops in Geo. It just depends on the model. I think uh what are we at still over a million so we got we got a ways to go it's pretty amazing how well it, it holds the details though i just scribbled those runes on there to as an example and then we'll... 600,000, probably about two or three more. I 
And you can play around with the settings to make it go faster. That way it'll, it'll decimate it further each time. But I have it set pretty pretty low. That way it um it'll really hold the information better. Just want to kind of take a look at it every now and then, make sure it's not losing its silhouette, because that's like the main thing. As long as the silhouette holds true. You're usually safe. Unless you have like super micro details on there, like skin, maybe. Like if you're doing like skin or like hair follicles or something. Then you might not be able to get away with decimating it this much. That should work. The total active points. Here it goes again. That is so weird. Why did it do that? Well, anyways, we can use that as an example to poly paint it again. The full object. Group, and we'll make this one green. Fill object. There we go. All right, so we have the model poly painted, or essentially that's just a fancy way of saying vertex colors and decimated. So it's pretty much ready to be brought back into Blender. And the easiest way to do that is when you export it, you just have to make sure this little paintbrush icon is on. For each of the subtools you want to have uh, the poly paint applied to. And an easy way to make sure that that's going on is if you hit the poly paint drop down and make sure colorize is on, it should be act it should activate that on all the subtools. Let me let me get rid of this. And I think it'll be Faster to just merge this together. Let me save it first. Yeah, just make sure you save your files a lot in ZBrush because ZBrush ZBrush can crash a lot, and it is not fun when it does that. So we'll just go ahead and merge these down. And because they have poly paint applied to it, we won't have to worry about the color maps and stuff. And then you just uh, hit export. And so here, and we'll call this mastered board. Desi for decimated. Um, no, I did them in ZBrush, uh, but you can do it in Blender if you want. Yeah, I wanted to uh, point something out. Um, oh, here we go. When you export, if you look up here where it says export tool, it should say exported with uh, vertex color or poly paint. Now we want to call this sword. Let me just export that again and if you it should you should see that pop up up here in the the info when it exports it so if you hit save yes we want to yeah writing i don't know if you guys caught that it said writing object with poly paint so when you hop back in a blender and hide everything and we'll go back into object mode. Let me hop into this layer. And if we import that, 
Oops, let me, uh, maybe, maybe that'll be a better spot. File, import, obj. It should import it with the polypaint. Oh, oh, there it is. Oh, man. It did that, uh, the ZBrush special right there. <laughs> I hate that. See, let's uh, rotate it. There we go. And yeah, and it split everything, so I still haven't figured out totally why ZBrush uh, exports and imports things weird. Like, even if you go into the, uh, like, the settings import export and try to switch stuff it, it still doesn't always work it's super frustrating um so let me join these together and then we'll go into edit mode and then you have to select all the faces and control n to norm set them the scale uh if you want to apply scale in, in Blender, you just hit Control A, and then you hit Rotation and Scale. But this should be the scale with the other one. We'll find out in a second here. Yeah, yeah, they're matching up just right. Oh, and we're missing the pommel, of course. Oops. That on this there we go so let's see let's hide that one and we'll go back into edit mode yeah, and the like you can kind of see that it looks Like the shading is, it's literally upside down. Like the light is coming from underneath as opposed to coming from the top because ZBrush, uh, their up and down or their Y plane is the other way. If you ZBrush B2. You can do, I think you're talking about the go B. Um, the Gobi does work well, but it doesn't, I, it doesn't import the, uh, the poly paint. I don't know why I don't, maybe I have a setting, something set wrong, but for some reason it doesn't import the poly paint. And if we hop into... Oh, and of course it didn't import the poly paint here. What is up with that? All right, let's try this a different way. It said imported with, uh, exported with poly paint. But another thing you can do, it's a little bit of a pain in the butt to do it this way. But if you hit, use the FBX import exporter. Yeah, that's what I'm going to try this time. And then we'll just hit export. I think that should be fine. We'll call this. Or.
the FBX uh, always takes a little while to import and export. All right, so we'll hop back to this layer now. And one thing I think you have to play with the scale whenever you import it. Um, let's see what happens when we do it as the default. I think it's going to be super small. Either going to be huge or small. And it can take a little while. Yeah, see, it's, it's super tiny. <laughs> so let me delete that. And I think we have to... For the scale, I think you have to hit it, scale it up by 10. But this, uh, this way you'll definitely get the, the poly paint. I can't remember if you have to scale it by 10 or 100. I think... I think it's a hundred. Let's see what it looks like on the other layer. Okay, that's That's the first one we brought in. And there it is. Yeah, so that was scaled by 10. So I think we have to do it by 100. Let's try it one more time. I should probably write this down. And this isn't just a blender thing. I know people have this issue with, uh, with Maya as well and uh, 3ds Max. Um, I'll show you the... Uh, like right now we have... This is, looks right. It's all decimated. Um, it looks a little wacky because it's not, uh, we'll just go to flat or smooth. Smooth shading. I might have decimated it a little too low. I'm losing some of the, the detail. But it did bring in the vertex colors. And that was one of the main things we were shooting for. Um, for the blade, I probably shouldn't have decimated it so much. But when you use Gobi, whoops. If you use Gobi, I'll uh, hop over to this layer. I'll enable that. Um, What will happen is it'll bring it in. Well, usually it does. Sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, that's what I thought might happen. Sometimes if you press the button, it. All right, I think it's doing it. Nope. <laughs> yeah, Gobi's a little wacky. Like I find it's hit or miss. Um, I find that it works very well for taking your model out of Blender. But it, I've had 
not so good luck with uh, importing back into Blender with Gobi. Okay, so let's see. We got the poly paint. Oh, wrong one. Oh, there's the Go B one. All right, what happened? Oh, you're welcome. I mean, I, I, I hesitate to like say that it's a tutorial because I'm. I don't. I, I wouldn't call it a tutorial. It's more like a. learn from my mistake series <laughs> okay let's import that again and we have the scale set to 100 as an fbx file and that should bring it in right it does take a second to import it whenever you save or export a fbx it just takes a little longer And there we go. We got the vertex paint. And this one, let's go to object mode. Eight. I think that's centered. That might not be centered, but. And this should be our. No poly. No, let me just import it again, make sure it's centered. Let me start renaming things so that I'm a little more organized. That's our sword low. This one, I will just put on this layer over here so it doesn't confuse me. I'll import that one one more time. And like I said, we have it set to 100. That's, uh, that's the scale you need to scale up if you're using the standard Blender units, if you're importing as an FBX file from uh, ZBrush. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, I, when I made that video, it was a. Uh, I mean, I maybe you guys encountered the same issues I did, but like, when I first started using Substance Painter, I was getting so frustrated. because it was because I just was running into uh, so many issues and even though I was following tutorials um, nothing ever worked out exactly how I wanted it to sword all right so we have both our sword high now and our sword low and we have the vertex paint so that'll make our color ID map when we import that <clears throat> or excuse me when we bake it and if well uh, I'll split these apart real quick so let's start with the low oh that's the high I guess I'll start with the high um, And start this part. Just kind of break each part off. And 
I want these to be one part. Oh, we could probably get away with keeping these on that too. And then we want I guess we should separate these just in case you wanted them to bake separately. And this part. Not sure what happened there. I think we can just delete that part. And then we have the blade. The blade had three parts. Let's see what part is that? Yeah. All right, and we'll start with this piece and we will call this blade. Sometimes I wonder how people come up with their naming conventions. Blade center uh let's call it lower center lower center and you got to make sure you put that high and that way we will know that this is the blade lower center high and we'll call this one Blade, center, what? I see substance painter killing coat and dedu. Hi. Um, huh. Not, not sure what you meant there. But anyways, so you go to the next part. Yeah, uh, yeah 3D code's pretty good too. I haven't used it in a long time. Um, but anyway, so we got the blade center high. And then we got the blade center, lower center high. And then we'll just call this outer part the blade high. And then this is the guard. Hi. And you basically do this for each part. This is the, we'll just call this grip. Hi. And then you have the pommel. We'll call this pommel center. And we'll just call this pommel. And then we have each of our parts for the high poly. And then I'll just box select all these and move them to this layer. That way it's easier for me to kind of separate the two. And we'll just go through this and do the same thing for the low. So we'll just grab each major piece and break it off. And these three, we want to be one piece. And then this. And this will be the pommel low. And as long as you make sure your naming convention, it has the same name, like pommel center high, pommel center low. As long as it's exactly the same, except for the very end, the suffix, the high or low, 
when you bake it, you use that as your identifier or to do a to bake without the cages intersection intersecting with each other. Grip low. Oops. But we still have to we still have to un UV map it. Uh, and and pack it. So keep that in mind. Um, and let's see. Okay, it's getting a little late. One, I'll finish doing the naming on these parts. Uh, let's see, what was this? Blade. Enter. Hello. Blade. And then I'll, I will. Uh, I'll do a quick unwrap of it and a and quick pack. And then on Friday, uh, we'll come back and we'll take it in a substance painter and bake out the, uh, the maps real quick. Uh, blade, oops. <laughs> Sorry, I'm uh, running short on time here. And we have the blade. Lower center, that's what I call this one. Okay, just making sure everything lines up. All right. So we have our two swords, our low poly and our high poly. And again, this on this one, I probably should not have decimated this part so much, but uh, just so, what is it, Rydell? Just keep that in mind when you're doing it, Rydell. Just uh, keep a close eye on the, uh, the blade for your, when you're decimating in ZBrush. Although that might look kind of cool. Like it looks, it's like a free damage detail on your sword. So yeah, I'll, I'm going to save this and then on Friday, we'll cover the uh, baking and substance painter. And tomorrow, when I have some free time, I'll, I, I should be able to get the, uh, do a quick UV map and packing uh, on it. It does take a little... Uh, it takes a while to, to pack stuff, but we'll do a quick pack on this since it's just for uh, just for the stream. Um, but yeah, I'll get that then. And on Friday, we'll be back and we'll texture it in Substance Painter. Texture and bake. All right, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, I'm glad everybody's, or not everybody, but I'm glad you guys are getting uh, some use out of the streams. I do really enjoy doing the streams. Um, next week, I will hop back onto the, the, the project I'm working on for my stylized diorama. And it, uh, I'm going to be doing a working on a wall, tiling wall texture. Um, it's going to be part stone and part wood. So if you are into that, feel free to drop by and also on Saturdays I am still doing the game streaming um, I mostly just mess around and explore stuff but I also uh, do it with the intent of of looking for things to model for myself kind of as a personal challenge so I will see you guys on Friday for now, have a good day and see you soon.